Good afternoon. How are you doing? Good. You have your Halloween costumes ready? Oh, yeah. Yes? Wearing my nails. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is Dalmata? I'm a cheetah. Dalmatia, and how was it? Yeah, a cheetah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Anyone else wants to share his or her <laughs> costume, Halloween costume? No? Yeah. Okay. All right. So if not, then let's continue <laughs> talking about uh, plasticity and inelasticity. What I mean, I lost, I lost the image. All right. <coughs> So uh, we are going to now introduce some equations that are going to allow us to see when we get to the yield stress, but in three dimensions. This simple plot of a tensile test is for one dimension. And we're going to repeat it uh, because it's very useful, and we can base our equations on that. Uh, basically, when we do this kind of test in one dimension and we get to a maximum value after which the strain changes but stress doesn't change anymore. This is the value that we call sigma y and the y comes from yield, yield stress. Notice that it's not failure stress, it's yield stress because the solid is, is not broken. It's just yielding. And in this kind of test, we don't have any stress in the other two directions. So it's a three-dimensional test. There is no such thing as a, a like a, an actual one-dimensional test. They are always three-dimensional. It's just that some of the conditions may be uh, different in the other two dimensions. In this case, the other two are uh, zero, okay? So what we could say in this case is that, for example, sigma one is equal to sigma two equal to zero, understanding that those two are for uh, compression, for positive values. And since this is a tensile test, the sigma three at failure is equal to, or at yield, I should say, not at failure, at yield is equal to sigma y. But it's truly a three-dimensional test. Okay, so we're going to use now this kind of test to see where a material could fail, but now in a three-dimensional state of stress. And in order to do that, we're going to write a function that is going to allow us to see where we get to yield. And this function is going to depend on the stress tensor. And we're going to make that equal to, uh, it could be a vector, but in this case I'm just going to simplify it to some value that here I call k. And such equation that tells me when I reach failure or when I reach yield, it's something called, just in very general terms, a failure criterion or a yield criterion, you could also say that. We'll see later on when we make a difference between failure and yield. Okay, but we need to make a few simplifications in order to to write these equations. And these uh, simplifications are very important, especially when we talk about real rocks, because some of these simpli uh, simplifications are going to assume isotropy. So I could either work with a full stress tensor with its values and directions, or I could also say that this is a function of the principal stresses but also on the directions of those principal stresses. That would be equivalent to working with a full stress tensor. 
And when I do that, I can, uh, I can work in terms of an isotropy. If I know directions of the material and I know directions of the stresses, I could use an anisotropic uh, failure criterion. But we're not going to do that. We're going to simplify this a little bit further. And if I write a failure criterion that is just a function of the principal stresses and not of the directions, then going from here to here involves an assumption with it is isotropy. And that means that it doesn't matter what is the direction of the principal stresses, the criterion is going to be the same. And clearly, when we do that, we're assuming isotropy. But in some cases, as I told you before, the, the materials are not isotropic, and, and doing from here to here for some materials and real rock may not be correct. OK. So I could either work with, with the stresses, but we're going to see that it's a lot uh, more meaningful in, instead of sometimes talking about stresses to talk about stress invariants. Like the invariants I1, I2, I3, I could also put J2 in there. It's going to be in a slightly different function, but uh, it could be, could be written like that too. It's just, we just need a function that tells us that for certain combination, the material is a failure. For example, for this 1D experiment, we know that if sigma 3 is equal to sigma y, given these conditions, the material is a failure. OK, good. So let's start with the first one, which is the simplest yield criterion in general for solids, and it's called the Tresca criterion. In the Tresca criterion, what you do is you fix a maximum value of stress based on this type of test of a simple uh, tension or compression. Let's, we're going to work in compression, so let, let's take this into compression and let's assume that the material is going to yield also in compression at the same value of sigma y. That means that if my stresses are zero in one direction and are equal to sigma y in the in another direction, so in two directions I'm going to have zero, in the other direction I'm going to have sigma y, this delimits what is the maximum diameter of the Mohr circle. The Mohr circle cannot be larger than, the diameter cannot be larger than sigma y. Because if it does, then the principal stress is going to be larger than sigma y and it's going to break. OK, so let's extend that now. Whenever we have a stress in the other two directions that are not equal to 0. Well, according to this yield criterion, let me do it in color, the only thing that you limit is the diameter of the circle. So any m state of stress, as long as it's more circle, has a diameter. Let's say this one is sigma 3, this one is sigma 1. As long as sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is equal or smaller than sigma y, then that's OK. When it reaches sigma y, then it, it's a yield. But then uh, before that, it, it's not going to be a yield. What is going to be then the maximum radius of the Mohr circle in this case? Sigma. It's just going to be, yeah, just sigma y divided by 2. 
this type of uh, yield criterion is uh, very popular in uh, in metals because at uh, the applications engineer applications of most metals let's say for aerospace or structural engineering the mean stress does not make does not modify much the yield stress so this is more or less a flat line it doesn't matter what, what the mean stress is the maximum shear stress is going to be always more or less the same and we can simplify then this criterion as uh, I wrote over here we could say that either uh, well not that sigma 1 minus sigma 3 has to be smaller than a value or that is sigma y or in general for a given set of principal stresses that are not necessarily ordered from the smallest to the biggest or to the biggest to the smallest and I'm going to call this 1, 2, 3 but with Roman numbers sigma 1 minus sigma 3 absolute value has to be smaller than sigma y but the same thing has to happen with the sigma 2 and the same thing has to happen between sigma 2 and sigma 3 so remember all of these are principal stresses but they are not ordered or not sorted uh, according to which one is the biggest and which one is the, the smallest. They are just some principal stresses on a, on a given coordinate system. Okay. So by having these three principal stresses and then uh, extending this equation to these three directions, uh, now we can see what this equation looks like kind of in three dimensions um, for that we're going to have to use a new type of plot which is called the principal stress space principal stresses are very important because no matter what is your stress tensor you can always calculate principal stresses and assuming an isotropic solid we just if we just have principal stresses that's everything we need in order to say whether it is at yield or not so this is going to be the principal stresses space uh, we're going to start with the 2d version of that principal stress space if i were to have for example here sigma 1 and here sigma 2 I'm going to uh, plot the Tresca criterion in here. Let's say that sigma 2 is equal to 0. And le let's assume sigma 3 is uh, also, in this case, let's say it's equal to 0. If sigma 2 is also equal to 0, what is going to be the maximum value of sigma 1? Roman. maximum value or the yield value uh, it is just if this one is equal to zero sigma the maximum value is just going to be sigma y sigma y so it's just going to be a value somewhere over here Okay, what about if sigma 2 is different than 0, but sigma 3 is still equal to 0? What is going to be the maximum value of sigma y? Sig sigma y minus sigma 3. But sigma 3 is still equal to 0. So here we are comparing always the biggest with the smallest. What is going to be the maximum value of sigma Roman 1 
when sigma 2, let's say, is somewhere around here, it's not 0, but sigma 3 Roman is still equal to 0. So you tell me why Roman and sigma 3 are equal? The same, the same, Rodrigo. Yes. So just going to be something like this. So this quadrant is like, uh, oh, mm, I shouldn't have, all right. This quadrant is compression, compression. And, and here, since this is still zero, uh, the maximum value is gonna, gonna still be that. If now sigma, uh, Roman uh, 2 would be uh, sigma 1 would be equal to 0 and sigma 2 is not 0 but it's compression its maximum value is going to be also sigma y and if sigma 1 Roman is different than 0 but still sigma 3 is different than 0 still this is going to be a line like this and remember, we're assuming also that, and that's also something that doesn't happen in rocks, that sigma y is the same for compression and tension. So if I go to the tension, tension quadrant, this is going to look very similar. Where now this is negative sigma y, this is negative sigma y. And as long as both of those one of those is zero or they are in tension, this is what I'm going to, you're going to see. So the limit then is here, there, here, and there. Okay, let me make the picture now a little bit more complicated. Remember, sigma three is equal to zero, okay? What about if sigma Roman 1 is here? Is 0.5 of sigma y negative? What is going to be the maximum value of sigma 2 Roman? What is the, the minimum stress right now? The least principal stress here. So if this one is zero and if this one is negative now the least principal stress is going to be negative 0.5 of sigma y and if the if the minimum is negative 0.5 of sigma y what is going to be the maximum stress according to this stress curve criterion which that i have right here sigma y over 2, so it's going to be like something something here. And the same thing now if I have tension in sigma 2 Roman, the maximum compression in sigma y Roman is going to be something like a point over here. And this is going to be a line that is going to be something like this. So in two dimensions, this Tresca criterion now, it looks like a deformed hexagon with sharp corners. As long as you are inside this hexagon, then you're not a yield. When you touch the hexagon, you are at the yield stress. So we have extended this Tresca criterion for three dimensions, but with one condition that sigma, one of the sigmas is equal to zero. One of the principal stress is equal to zero. Okay, I, I, I hope that you see why we have this hexagon with sharp edges, and we're gonna extend now this to three dimensions. In three dimensions, we're still going to use this principal stresses space, but now we're going to plot this with three vectors where this is going to be the first principal stress, this one the second, and this one the third. Again, remember, this 
Roman sigmas are, are not sorted by magnitude. Okay, uh, we're going to need a, uh, a few more definitions here to make this easier. Whenever you have a state of stress in which all the principal stresses are the same, that's going to be an isotropic state of stress. And that, let's say this one is equal to that one, and if I go the same amount in here, this, this is going to be an axis This is going to be an axis, which is going to be a line that goes from here to that point, and also goes into the uh, negative side. So now we're looking at the positive quadrant of this, uh, I don't know how to call that, it wouldn't be a cube, it would be cube divided in eight parts. All right, so then this axis is the axis of sigma one equal to sigma two equal to sigma three. And this axis is usually called hydrostatic axis, but I, I don't like to call it hydrostatic because we in, ge in geoscience, we understand for hydrostatic something which is in equilibrium with a column of water. And uh, I would rather call it the isotropic, stress isotropic axis. But the meaning is that all stresses are the same. All right, so let me ask you, if all the stresses are the same, would that be at yield according to the Tresger criterion? Here or there? So if I have a point somewhere, let's say over here, could that be at yield, a point on the isotropic axis? No, right? Because that's, I mean, a point over here it could be uh, a point uh, here at the center where bo both are zero, or it could be a point, uh, uh, it cannot be anywhere in here because sigma three is equal to zero. So if sigma three is equal to zero and all of them are equal, that's right there. But I could have any of these stresses to be different than zero, and they, if they are all equal, what would be the difference between the maximum and the minimum principal stress? will be zero, and so then it's not going to be a failure. According to this criterion, I can go infinitely in compression, infinitely in tension, but as, as long as the Mohr circle does not go beyond a certain radius, I'm not a failure. And here is going to be the same, but now it, it is in three dimensions. This axis is actually this line, and perpendicular to that axis, <coughs> we're going to have what is called, and let me see if I can do this well. I'm, I'm just drawing here a section of that plane, but this is a plane per perpendicular to this line. Let's see if this plot turns out more or less all right. And that plane is called the deviatoric plane. And any state of stress can result in a combination of an isotropic stress plus a deviatoric component. So this is the same thing as partitioning the stress tensor into the isotropic and the deviatoric parts, but it's, it's graphic representation. And according to, if we were to do this, uh, let, let me, I'm just trying to fix a little bit my my plot. If we were to do this, the Tresca criterion would look something like this. It's going to look like an hexagon. And let, let me 
Well, let me do it first with pencil and then I'll do it with, with color. On the deviatoric plane, then the Tresca criterion is going to look like an hexagon, something like this. Uh, and we, we saw why we have those sharp edges. I think that's okay. And that, that's going to be on a given deviatoric plane. But if we extend this in three dimensions, then this is going to be like this, like that, like this, and like that, with also these lines going into uh, in this direction. And this is going to be a 3D surface. Uh, yes, Stephanie, you were about to say is something? The axis coming out of the origin? The axis, yes. So the axis uh, is coming like in this direction. Yeah, but and this entire hexagon also is coming into this direction, the positive side. So remember, the line, that line, the hydrostatic or isotropic line is the line with sigma one is equal to sigma two is equal to sigma three. And this three-dimensional surface limits all the possible state of stress according to the principal stresses in three dimensions. As long as you're inside the surface, that's fine. According to this failure criterion, you cannot be outside this hexagon because if you are, it will be like passing this line or like in terms of more circle passing that line. That's not possible. Again, you can see that this surface is parallel to the isotropic axis. So you can go infinite in compression, infinite in tension. And according to this failure criterion, uh, that it's going to be fine. But we know that in rocks, that that's not the case. All right, and one more thing. So this thing here is called a failure or a yield surface. What kind of material usually follow this? Steel. steel. For steel, you can use this very confidently. <coughs> and uh, in general, for the level of compression and tension on terms of uh, mean value that, that we use in engineering applications, uh, it, it keeps more or less the same value all the time. I mean, for st we, we cannot go infinitely large in compression, infinitely small, but for typically engineering applications, this is going to be fine. Okay. There is a problem with this type of failure surface. Uh, and the problem is that it's not mathematically very friendly because when you get to these points, you have two derivatives and uh, you have uh, derivatives that depend on which, which side you approach the surface. And, and you know, when, when you get into uh, plastic calculations, that, that's, that's not easy to deal with. And uh, it's not realistic either to consider that case. So there is, a, I, I don't know if to say an upgrade, but uh, another version of this, which is called, and probably you heard about this, is the von Mises yield criterion. And what von Mises that is uh, simply to fit a circle around that hexagon. So if I had, again, this hexagon like this, and uh, 
you feed a circle to that so this will be the center of the hexagon let me see if I can do it with uh, you remove those sharp edges and now you have a curved surface which looks like a cylinder and according to von Mises if you call this the center at the isotropic axis a point P and any point on the yield surface a point N the distance between uh, P and N or the radius of the circle on the deviatoric a plane the maximum value is going to be uh, or not let, let me just save this for now but uh, let, let me ask you if we're talking on the deviatoric plane what quantity would you use to characterize the distance from here to any point on the deviatoric plane that's going to be proportional to what? The radius, but in more like uh, mechanistic uh, concepts, in close. What did we use in order to characterize deviatoric stress in three dimensions in general? You're, you're going in the right direction, Bezani. The distance between OP is also going to be proportional to this quantity, this other quantity. OP is going to be equal to, let me check this because I don't have it in here. I can make the math is going to be proportional to the first invariant of the stress tensor and PN then we, we would like to make it proportional to which other quantity the J2 and in this case this is going to be let me extend this square root uh, or oh no, I think it's okay like this Play. okay okay uh, wait, wait a minute Okay. Uh, there is another equation I wrote in here. So Pn is going to be proportional to sigma y, where sigma y here goes with this equation. So J2 is equal to sigma y divided square root of 3 uh, so if that's the case then this is going to be I, I think this is correct just let me change this this is square root of 2 times square root of j2 
but that's eventually linked the the maximum radius of the of the circle is linked to uh, the yield stress and this is what we did uh, if you remember at the beginning of uh, the discussion about geomechanics and talking about about I1 and J2 it's instead of you know why would you draw a circle in which the the distance from in the deviatoric plane from the center to any point is is the same it doesn't make sense so it's just a lot easier to make a plot here with the first invariant in the x-axis and the square root of j2 in the in the other axis and what this is the von Mises criterion is telling is that there is a maximum value for that which let's call it a value equal to k that uh, well let me do with color that that's going to be uh, the yield limit and according to this equation the maximum value is sigma y divided square root of 3 if you were to measure from a uniaxial stress not the uniaxial strain the uniaxial stress test uh, so this is the same test that we did before where we pull until it breaks with no stress on, on the other sides and that value is, is sigma y so according to this von Mises criteria then the square root of j2 cannot be higher than this and when you put this together into into this type of plot you get that the circle of this surface or the radius of this circle uh, is going to be uh, two times square root of j2 or also we can write it again the square root of two uh, thirds times sigma y okay so I'm, I'm not showing here the demonstration of this but uh, it's, it's just geometry all right so we have talked about yield uh, criteria in which the only important thing is the deviatoric stress or the deviatoric component and that's basically shear that's that's uh, a failure in shear let's now talk about another type of uh, of failure in which we consider stress sensitivity that means that it's not going to be the same to be here or to be there or to be there so what would you do in order to incorporate stress sensitivity if i1 matters then what's going to happen with this line what would you say Bethany okay and the line then is going to be So if we draw again here J2 and here I1, the material is going to get stronger, it's going to bear more deviatoric stress as you have a higher I1. So now this line is going to be something like this. It's not going to be flat anymore. And most and very important too it's not only that the material gets stronger as you have a higher mean effective stress but also we have a cut off stresses or the mean stress cannot be lower than 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 this point because at this point uh, is going to fail 
So it cannot be somewhere in here, outside this. It just can be on this side. And probably uh, that's going to uh, be a little bit better illustrated in three dimensions. So if we draw that in three dimensions, this is going to be like this. It's going to look like like a cone. So if this is the hydrostatic axis. This is going to look like this. Like an ice cream cone. All right, so if this is a cone uh, and we uh, consider a, a curved surface, this is the criterion which is called the Drucker Prager criterion. And uh, it, it's very simple, it's just uh, very similar to, to von Mises, in which uh, we just say that the maximum J2 is just equal to a constant. But in Drucker Prager, now it's going to be aligned with the slope. So the maximum J2 is going to be equal to a constant. Let's call it a constant 3 plus another constant, which is going to be the slope times the first invariant. I'll tell you what this C3 and C4 is in just a bit. Uh, we could also use this type of failure criterion, which is the Tresca criterion, and we could write equations in such a way that this is going to be the modified Tresca criterion, in which now sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is going to be equal to a constant plus another constant times, uh, in this case would be, we could put I1, but we, uh, yeah, we could put I1 here. Or sigma M is the same. Well, let's put sigma M. Uh, my eraser is here, so. Yeah, it just fell a few minutes ago. Sigma M, just to, to uh, that's a mean stress. Modified Tresca. This is the Tresca criterion. Uh, no, this is Drager Prager. Yeah. Uh, modified Tresca, I'm going to draw it right now. Oh. It's just going to look like, again, like an hexagon. Inside that circle. So modified Tresca is going to be uh, this one. Yeah. It's the hexagon, and Drucker Prager is is a cone. You could use both of those, and and you can capture the stress sensitivity of a material. And just to complete the picture here, if you were to use a, a friction angle. In this Drucker Prager criterion, C3 will be equal to six times, and we're going to see what the value, what these parameters mean, S0 and cosine of phi. But let me write it now so I don't have to come back and write it again later. And C4 is going to be another constant, which is also depends on the friction angle. Well, uh, three minus sine of five. All right, 
So C4 just depends on the friction angle, and C3, which is this constant, it depends also on a value which is cohesive strength. Uh, for example, if cohesive strength were to be zero, then the tip of the cone will be at the origin. If it's not zero, that means the material is cemented, and the tip of the cone is on the negative side. That means that it can bear some uh, tensile stress. This is cohesive strength, and we're going to see later what this is. Just hang on a little bit till we get there. This cohesive strength, this is friction angle. Okay, well, the Drucker Prager criterion is very popular and in many types of uh, mechanical software that simulate plasticity uh, because it's a very simple extension of the uh, just the, the von Mises criterion. And the equation is very simple. Square root of J2 equal to a constant plus another constant times I1. And as long as you are inside this cone, then uh, that uh, is not a yield. If you are outside, it is a yield. Okay, these failure surfaces are, are pretty pretty easy. I'll show you some failure surfaces later on that are a, a lot more complicated. But, but hopefully you get the idea. It's a surface that limits the possible state of stresses uh, in terms of principal stresses. If you are in the axis, it's an isotropic state of stress. If you are outside the axis, you are not in an isotropic state of stress. And how far away from the axis you are, it indicates the amount of deviatoric stress. All right, are we okay to continue? Any question? So let me put this together. Uh, we know what these failure surfaces are. And uh, let's work now on a more realistic failure criterion, particularly for rocks and sediments. And this is not going to be only stress sensitive, but uh, it's also going to be applicable to geomaterials. Okay. Here we're going to see the reason why a material gets stronger as you apply more effective mean stress. And the reason is very simple. I'll see if uh, next class I, I bring an example to show that, but uh, I, I forgot for this time. But you all know this, and it shouldn't surprise you. But we're going to see how that plays in the equations later on. Let's say that you have a solid here, and you apply a stress sigma n apply on the entire surface, okay? And then you want to move this block with a stress tau apply on all this surface. What is uh, Let, let, let me let me change this because I now realize that the answer is going to vary depending on something. Let's make this a cube with same area in on the sides and on the top. But the question is the same. What is the stress I need in order to move this block when I apply a given sigma n?
So sigma n, let's say that this is Fn times an area, and tau is Ft times the same area. OK, so Ft times that area uh, is going to be tau, the shear stress, the higher the normal stress I put on this block, the, the higher the shear stress I, I have to, to put here, or the transversal stress to put here, right? And this is going to be proportional to the friction coefficient. So the more normal stress I have, the higher the shear stress, or the transversal uh, force I need in order to move this block. And this is just because of friction. If we put this into a more circle space where I have here sigma n and tau, this is just a line. that tells me that the higher the normal stress, the then the larger the, the shear stress I need in order for that to move. All right, but in, uh, in rocks and in garden material, it, it's exactly the same thing, but it's just a little bit different on how you look at these stresses. So let's imagine that we have a granular medium. And that this granular medium is subjected to stresses that compress it in all directions. If you want this material to fail, uh, which that would mean to for the grains to move with respect to each other, then you need to overcome the friction forces at the at the interfaces between the grains. Because of the normal stresses at each contact, you're going to have normal stress that develop at the contact. And the higher those normal stresses are because of confinement, also the higher are going to be the friction stresses that you need in order for those grains to move with respect to each other. So it's exactly the same thing as what we have over here. The higher the normal stress, the higher the friction between the grains. And that's going to make uh, the rock uh, stronger. OK, so let's now convert this in terms to uh, convert this to principal stresses. Let's say that I have a stress here from the side sigma 3, and I have stress in this direction sigma 1. The question is, what is the maximum sigma 1 that you can put given a value of sigma 3? What is the maximum principal stress given a value of the least mi uh, principal stress? Um, well that would be a deviatoric stress, oh. sigma 1 minus sigma 3. But let's just think on absolute values of sigma 1 and sigma 3. All right. But we can do that because that would be exactly the Mohr circle, right? The Mohr circle we have the, its lowest value, let's say somewhere here, sigma 3. And how far I can increase sigma 1 would depend on that line 
and the maximum value will be given by a circle that is tangent to this line. This is the friction angle and the tangent of the friction angle is equal to the friction coefficient. Okay. Because of this property of materials that have a friction between each other, now we can have stresses, principal stresses, effective stresses, which are different in two different directions. And it, it is just because of friction. You don't need any cementation. These two can be different as long as you have friction. If you don't have friction, this line is just flat and, and you cannot hold differential stresses in the friction material. But if you have some, call it confinement or effective mean stress, you can hold the deviatoric stress. Okay. N now let's see uh, how much is that uh, difference and the relative value between those stresses. All right, this is the friction angle. This is the definition. I, and it is this equation. This is tau equal to sigma n times the tangent of the friction angle. And that's that angle. Let's look at the center of the Morse circle. And we said that this circle will be tangent to that line. That's the point at which I get failure or yield. So a line perpendicular to that line and is going to go through the center of the circle. Let's call the center of the circle C and the radius of the circle R. What I'd like to know is what is sigma 1 divided by sigma 3? What is the maximum value of sigma 1 given a value of sigma 3? If you look at the circle, uh, this is going to be let me add one more thing. Let me put the R on this side. Uh, because of the properties of triangles, notice that this one is going to be also the friction angle. So this angle is going to be that one. So sigma 1 then is going to be the center plus the radius. Sigma 3 is going to be the center minus the radius. Where the radius, or no, let me do the, let me see which one I do. No, I'll do the radius. The radius is equal to the center, and this is also a friction angle, is the center times the sine of angle of the friction angle. So this is the hypotenuse, and this is the angle. So the R should be uh, the sine of the angle times C. And this is R is C times the sine of phi, and since C is the same, I get that the this value, which is called stress and isotropy ratio, is equal to one plus sine of friction angle divided one minus sine of friction angle. That's a maximum stress that I can get in these conditions. And you could also say, we could write this a little bit differently. We could say the maximum allowable principal stress in compression is going to be this coefficient that we're going to call Q. Uh, this is a different thing to PQ that we have seen before. 
times sigma 3. Yeah, it's a different heat. Uh, if friction angle, typical friction angle is about 30 degrees. So if friction angle is 30 degrees, what is going to be Q equal to? Sine of 30? Point 0.5, right? So this is going to be 1.5 divided 0.5. This is going to be about 3. For typical friction angles, then the maximum stress and anisotropy ratio is, uh, is 3. So that means that you can put an effective stress, principal stress, 3 times higher in one direction respect to, to the other. And and we're going to do one more thing out of this that comes very nicely out of these equations. And it is, uh, let me move this over here. If we zoom out a little bit out of this uh, granular medium and we consider something a little bit larger, but again we have here sigma 1 and sigma 3. What this type of uh, failure criterion shows is that the rock is not going to fail at the point of maximum shear, which is this one, but it's going to fail at the point which is tangent to the circle, which for this particular case where there is no cohesive strength, that happens to be the point of maximum shear to effective normal stress. So you see all of these points here or there have a lower ratio of shear to effective normal stress. The maximum is right there. So it's at that plane that failure is going to happen, and that plane is going to be located at an angle which is not the angle, again, of maximum shear, but it's going to be a little bit beyond that. And notice one thing over here. This is sigma 1, right? And uh, let's see if I can use some color to make it more obvious. This is sigma 1, and the plane of sigma 1 is this one. This one is sigma 3. The plane of sigma 3 is this one. The angle in the Mohr circle to go from sigma 1 to sigma 3 is 180 degrees in the Mohr circle. But in reality, that's 90 degrees over here. To go from, uh, from here to there, that's 90 degrees. So if I look for this point over here, According to the Mohr circle, that's at an angle of 90 degrees plus friction angle. And that plane is going to be a plane which is at 90 degrees plus friction angle divided by 2 in reality. This is the plane at which the material is going to, to fail. And for it, a friction angle of, say, 30 degrees, this is about 60 degrees. That's why all these rocks always fail at sort of a steep angle, because this is a plane at which uh, you have the shear failure line meet 
the Mohr circle. And usually this angle, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to put any names, but, but it's the angle that, that you measure in this kind of test. And for example, if you had a normal fault, the dip of that normal fault will be that angle. If you have a reverse fault, this will be, will be the opposite, will be something like this, where the maximum stress goes in this direction and the minimum is vertical the dip of, of that fault will be 90 minus that angle. And it, it depends on that. The fault is going to be just a type of uh, shear failure, and the angle is going to be related to that friction angle. OK, so I think now, since we, we know what's going on here, we can add the the missing component which is what happens when this material is cemented well when this material is cemented then this line is not going to go through the center of the or the origin of coordinates anymore so if we have let me move a little bit just to the left If this is tau and this is sigma n, we said that a line like this would be for an uncemented rock or sediment. If this is a friction angle, if we have a cemented material, the line is going to be somewhere over here. The friction angle doesn't have to be the same. And uh, here we can deal with this either as a friction angle, or we can also say if this is one, this is the friction coefficient. And the intercept is what we call the cohesive strain S0. In this case, this is equal to mu times sigma n. In this case, it's S0 plus mu times sigma n. So we're just adding, uh, we're just adding a constant to that equation. All right, this is, we have already seen this, and uh, all the theory that you need it is in here. But however, it's more convenient to use principal stressors to calculate some of these parameters. And this is going to be equivalent to a plot in which this is a sort of principal stress plot too, but now we're going to use the least principal stress sigma 3 and the maximum stress sigma one. And when we have an uncemented material, this is going to be a line which is going to be something like this. If this is one, this is going to be that parameter Q, one plus a friction angle, one minus sine of friction angle. If we don't have any confining stress, then uh, we cannot bear any uh, stress in the other direction either. So this is an uncemented material. If we do have some cohesive component, this is going to be also a line with the same or, or with a different, but I mean it's, it's the same variable uh, friction component. And how would you call the intercept? If I do a test in which I have no confining stress and I measure the maximum compression strength, 
That's going to be the UCS, which stands for what? Unconfined compressive strength. So that's that value over there. So the equation for this is going to be sigma 1 a yield is going to be UCS plus sigma 3 times Q. And if I don't have any uh, cementation, this is just going to be sigma 3 times Q, what we just uh, saw uh, before. And uh, uh, in, in order uh, to, to make your life easier, you know what is the relationship between Q and the friction angle? This equation over here, uh, there is also an equation that relates UCS to the cohesive strength, and it's this one. So if you know the cohesive strength, you can calculate the UCS. If you know UCS, and also you know this parameter Q, you can calculate the cohesive strength. Okay, so why do I say that it is easier to work with this type of uh, space? Uh, and, and it is because when we do uh, this type of tests and we measure the, the properties of rocks, uh, what we measure is we set sigma 3, which is going to be a confining pressure, a minus support pressure, I'll, I'll show that, that just in a bit, and we measure what is the maximum value. So then we just plot points in this space, trace a line, and we get what the parameters of that are. If you want to do that with a more circle, you can also draw more circles, but then you have to throw a line, which is more or less tangent to all of those circles, and, and that's a little bit of a more complex problem. It's just a lot easier to throw a linear trend to a set of points and to throw a line to minimize uh, how tangent it is to more circles. And this is exactly what you have to do in the project for this week. I'm giving you data. I forgot again to bring the copies. Uh, but let me look for that over here. Okay, files. Okay, number six. I think we have nine project guys, so we're very close to, to finish this. Just hold on a little bit more and we'll get to there. Okay, here you have experimental data for a sandstone. We, we notice that we have done everything in terms of effective stresses of sigma so far. And that's because rocks fail due to effective stresses, not to total stresses. Uh, so there is one more component that we have to take care of. Uh, but uh, with this data of maximum principal total stress, maxi minimum principal total stress, and pore pressure, uh, you're going to be able to simplify all this data in terms of sigma 3 and sigma 1 and uh, the idea is that after you digitize that data you're going to get a cloud of points something like this and here there are some other symbols I want to explain why in a bit but all that data is going to more or less line up and it's going to give you, after you throw a linear trend to that, it's going to give you a value of Q, it's going to give you a value of UCS, where, where all these symbols belong to different pore pressure. But after you convert the data to effective stresses, they should all line up in a single trend. Okay, 
Uh, let me see how we're doing with this. Mm. Let's go 10 more minutes. So I tell you how, how to get to this. All right, that data set was done with a triaxial test. And it's actually a triaxial axisymmetric test with pore pressure. Let's see what that is. If I remember correctly, we failed one rock under compression here. Mm -hmm. And this rock looked like a cylinder to which we apply stresses axially. And this is going to be the rock. This is going to be a piston that applies stress. Here we're going to have a base. And I could apply a maximum total stress S1 until it fails. That will be an unconfined compression test. OK, but we're going to do a triaxial test. And remember, this is a cylindrical sample, so it has axial symmetry. In order to do this type of triaxial test, I think I talk about this when we talk about pore elasticity, right? Mm -hmm. Did I explain all the triaxial tests? But, but I don't remember if I explain all the triaxial tests, how it how it is done. I don't think so. I think I just explained about jacketed and jacketed, yeah. but didn't go in detail. OK, yeah, I think I did something very simple. OK, well, we're going to talk in detail now about the triaxial test. In order to run this triaxial test, you put a membrane around the sample. And uh, sometimes also you put some more rings in here so that fits very tight and there is there there is no fluid going into from the sample vessel into the into the rock. And we put all of these within a vessel usually made of steel that keeps the confining pressure in here. Usually, this shaft moves up and down. Uh, so here, you put also some moorings. And, and in this pressure vessel, Inside here, sometimes you can put, sometimes not all times, you could put a load cell. And uh, let, let me make this a little bit more complete. In order to measure S1, Here you put another load cell. So let's call this one number one and this one number two. OK. But at the end of the day, you're just applying an axial stress. If you have no pressure in here, then it's unconfined. But if you have a, a fluid system that applies a confining pressure, P 
Tc, then now your experiment is not going to be and usually you do that by using a, a large syringe that basically just injects fluid and maintains that at the target pressure, which in this case is PC. So this is always going to be filled with fluid and the pressure inside is going to be PC. But in addition to that, there is one more variable that is going to be that you can make hole here. And connect this to another uh, to another syringe, and this syringe is going to have. the pore fluid that applies the pore pressure PP. So now you have three variables. All right. What is the minimum principal stress, total stress, S3? Confining pressure. Confining pressure. S1 is just S1, yeah, what you would measure outside. But we're not interested in in that, we cannot fit a failure criterion to total stresses. We need effective stresses. What is going to be the effective least principal stress? PC minus PP and sigma 1 is going to be S1 minus PP. So from the data I gave you, if you know the pore pressure, if you know what is S1 and S3, you can calculate sigma 1 and sigma 3. And after you plot that, all your data, independently of what the value of pore pressure is, should line up more or less in a line. And if you throw a trend line to that, you will be able to, to fit the characteristic failure line uh, for that material. All right, so one more thing, uh, and this is about, um, uh, about these two load cells. Uh, sometimes we put a load cell outside, and that load cell number one is going to read uh, directly S1. Because even your confining uh, fluid is also going to push up. Even if you don't have uh, any deviatoric stress in the sample, as long as you have a pressure inside this, imagine that the rock isn't there. If the rock isn't there, the confining pressure is going to push this piston up. But even if when you have the rock, the fluid is going to get into this uh, gap and it's going to push up. So it's going to be S1. Uh, some other times, we use another low cell over here feels a confining pressure, but just measures the force that is actually applied on the rock. And that low cell number two is going to measure S1 minus S3. And it depends on, on which uh, device you're using, but, but usually most the most uh, accurate devices, they have a low cell inside the pressure vessel that tells you what the value of S1 minus S3 is. So if you want the value of S1, uh, you need to add 
confining pressure to that. And you're going to need this, I think, later on, if I remember correctly, in another homework. Yes, Jack. So, loss number one meets, uh, measures total stress in axial direction, but that also has confining pressure in it. Loss number two is independent of confining pressure. Doesn't measure confining pressure. Uh, imagine that there is a gap in here. And these are not touching. You could increase confining pressure as much as you want, but the load cell, which is designed to measure a, a very, very small shortening in this direction due to axial load, it's not going to measure e anything because the pore pressure is being applied or the confining pressure is being applied all around the load cell. So you can increase confining pressure as, as much as you want. Load cell number two shouldn't give any reading. It's just going to give a reading when actually the rock is pushing against that. That's uh, the only case in which you're going to get a reading. And because of that, what the low cell is going to measure is S1 minus S3, also called deviatoric stress. And since this is a difference, this is also equal to sigma one minus sigma three, also called deviatoric effective stress. All right, guys, uh, we'll take it from here on uh, Monday, all right? Welcome.